to be inclusive in approach when we're talking about cross-boundary collaborative conservation. We have to set a table that is big enough to, for all the involved partners. Also, our experience in the SAGE demonstrated to me that true collaborative efforts really take some time to marinate. And that's because it takes time to build the relationships among the involved partners to really get to a successful outcome. Some things just cannot be rushed. Third, I'm really conscious of the need to respect the needs of all the partners who come together while at the same time really genuinely seeking to address the ecological and biological realities of the species that we're trying to conserve. And that achieving the balance between those things will not happen without constant communication. Lastly, one of the lessons that I'm thinking about, I think is a, a paradox that we're really still struggling with, we're really still working on, and that is the Endangered Species Act can really act as a very significant catalyst to galvanize necessary meaningful conserv conservation. While at the same time setting some time frames that uh, are not always very flexible and may not always allow for the development of those relationships that I talked about and necessarily complex conservation strategies. So how do we successfully motivate and mobilize ourselves to get ahead, to get ahead of those timeframes that the ESA imposes? How can we foster and support self-directed, locally built partnerships where people build together an approach that will meet their objectives as well as the needs of species. Within the US Fish and Wildlife Service, we want to continue to support the long game of the sagebrush landscape, healthy sagebrush rangelands that work for both people and wildlife. And by definition, we think that achieving this goal will mean that we all have to continue to have a big tent approach to setting objectives, to developing the needed scientific information, to putting those effective efforts on the ground and constantly communicating among all partners. So if in the case of the sage grouse, the ESA served as a catalyst to get us started, is there work left to do? Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the places where we together have to get better, where we need more focus and more innovation and more results, frankly, is in regard to the invasion of non-native plants into the sagebrush ecosystem, cheatgrass and others. Non-natives, I think, may be the very definition of a cross-boundary threat. They don't respect any boundaries. And you all know they fuel way too frequent rangeland fire in a pretty vicious cycle of invade and burn, invade and burn. So I worry that this issue represents the single most important threat to that vision of a healthy landscape, to the sustainability of the entire ecological system, and to the human communities that depend on that system. We won't fight invasives in the sage without a coordinated, multi-scale, cross-boundary approach. Number one, stopping the spread of invasives into intact habitat through local early detection and rapid response efforts. Number two, continuous improvement in our restoration techniques that we need after fire. And three, the development of sufficient stocks of locally sourced native seed to ensure success of those restoration efforts. We are also going to need to overcome the institutional and fiscal realities that challenge us in addressing the threat of invasives. As a community of the West, we need to come together quickly and decisively to first add capacity for coordinated, coordinated invasive weed management programs, particularly to improve that early detection and rapid response to maintain intact plant communities before it's too late. So this capacity for coordinated action needs to happen first at the local level, all the way up through the state agencies, to the Western Association of State Departments of Agriculture, to the federal agencies. And the question is, how can people build that together? How can we build that coordinated structure together? Secondly, we need support for the national seed strategy to increase our post burden restoration success, which can happen when we have locally sourced genetically appropriate seed. So that strategy outlines efforts needed to ensure 
a reliable supply of that genetically appropriate seed so that we can count on being able to use the right seed in the right place at the right time. So as I look back on the last several years and consider how far we have really come together in crossing boundaries for conservation, in crossing physical and mental boundaries for conservation, in elevating the profile of sagebrush country to the rest of the country, and in conserving one of its signature species, as I look back on all that, I have hope. I have hope that we can marshal the same resolve that is gonna be needed to take the next step in this effort, and that is defeating the threat posed by invasive plants. Many of you know our good friend Jay Tanner from Box Elder County, Utah. He summed it up pretty well recently. He was quoted as saying, people of goodwill can accomplish a lot together. Thank you very much. I should perhaps wisely spend my five minutes uh, explaining the quote that John you attributed to me earlier in his remarks, but I'll refrain from doing that. Uh, I would refer back to Noreen's comments when she began her presentation about how we all need to work together and build those partnerships. Uh, that's really the theme of my remarks, but rather than be repetitive of what uh, Noreen has expressed so well, I, I will focus a little more on what I believe are some of the obstacles to achieving uh, that vision that I believe we all share in this room. Uh, and if, you know, if it comes down to two magic words, it's do you look at what's out there in the landscape as a threat to whomever we are, whether we're the landowner, the agricultural producer, the conservationist, the uh, timber industry, or do we all look at it as an opportunity to do things on a landscape scale? And specific to the ESA, I think, the thing that is so much in my mind is that we, we must talk about, and we do, the natural landscape out there, and what, what's the natural unit within which to do business. I think sometimes where we fail is to talk about the human landscape, and what's the landscape of humans that can come together and uh, have common interests and find common ground to move toward those goals. And, and that's gonna vary just like the, the landscape for a species varies. The landscape for the humans in some cases may be as large as the state or multiple states. On other issues, it may be as small as getting people together in a local community to work on some of these issues. And I think we need to be very sensitive to that as we talk about uh, landscape uh, scale work. And you know, thinking of threats versus opportunities, probably in, in my landowner community, there's nothing that better fits that uh, categorization than the Endangered Species Act. It's seen by some as a threat, it's seen by others as an opportunity. I think it properly functioning, it needs to be a little bit of both, and I will uh, go back to the sage grouse uh, situation that, that uh, Noreen mentioned. And certainly, we often hear the comment, well, the threat of a listing drove us to do something. Uh, certainly, that was there, and I don't want to diminish it, but that probably got us this far down the road. And shortly thereafter, I know at least in Wyoming, what drove us to move forward was not the threat of a listing, but the opportunity that we saw to collaborate and as a state and as a population within the state to do some things that served the sage grass while meeting the needs of all our various interests in the state. So uh, let, let's not overdo the threat component of the ESA, but, but really think about it as maybe just getting us out of the gate, but then the success is gonna depend not on that continued threat, but on our ability to come together and identify those opportunities and uh, move forward with them. And uh, along that line, uh, um, I have some sympathy for the Fish and Wildlife Service because they are in a difficult position. Uh, they're a regulatory agency charged with protecting species, charged with listing species, implementing the Endangered Species Act, yet they play a critically important role in other parts of the same agency of being the motivators, of providing funding for some of these projects. I think what's unfortunate, and I'm not sure how, how we overcome that, but for the vast majority of the public, their regulatory role is what identifies them, and their 
their collaborative role, their role in fostering uh, resource enhancements is, is sort of in the background there. If you've utilized the programs, like I know Pat O'Toole's used a nice number of them, they become really important to you. But if you've never utilized one of their partner programs or other similar programs, you think of them just as the regulatory agency. And I think we all need to help them uh, overcome that image if we're going to be uh, successful going forward. Uh, another obstacle that I've experienced that I think is important we address is that of interagency cooperation. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, in Wyoming, uh, after the issue of the sage grouse became a high profile issue, uh, we were able to sit down with Fish and Wildlife Service at the state level and in very efficiently, I think, develop a uh, candidate conservation agreement with assurances program to make available to landowners to deal with sage grouse. After we had accomplished that, it took a lot of high pressure and two years before we were able to get BLM offices in the state to embrace that and agree to offer candidate conservation agreements on federal lands. And the need for that coordination, I think, is, is uh, great. And, and not to get off too far on a, on a high-profile political topic today, but as you're all aware, Secretary Zinke has been talking about some regionalization uh, among the states. Um, uh, that would involve all of the agencies within Interior. Uh, one of the key points that I've been emphasizing, that our organization been emphasizing, regional coordination is good, but let's begin with a coordinator in each of our western states who's charged with making sure that the Fish and Wildlife Service and the BLM and the uh, National Park Service and, and the other federal agencies are all working together and that we've got a central point to go and we need to work with all those agencies. I think that would go a long ways toward addressing uh, some of these problems. Private landowners are seen by some as an obstacle to moving forward with conservation programs. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think any of us would argue with the fact that they're critical to moving forward with those programs. So how do we engage private landowners? How do we motivate private landowners? A couple of things come to mind, and I don't want to oversimplify, but the first of those is engage them early. Don't go to a private landowner and say, we have a plan. We'd like you to join us in implementing it. Go to the private landowner and say, we need to develop a plan. We want you at the table when that plan is developed. And uh, you know, in the West, we private land, or we ranchers are a pretty stubborn bunch of people. And if we're approached the right way, we can become your, you're shaking your head. You don't agree with me there. <laughs> um, we can become your best partners, but approach us the wrong way and we can become uh, the greatest threat to the success of whatever you're attempting to do. So I say invite, la in, invite landowners, involve landowners early. Uh, I think it's easier, frankly, for an agency like Fish and Wildlife to do that than it is for an agency like BLM. Because with BLM, with their massive land holdings in the western states, um, they're seen as the big threat out here. They're the thousand pound gorilla and, and it's really difficult for them to be able to convince me as a private landowner that owns lands intermingled in all of their lands that we can, we can embrace something and we can move forward as equal partners. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but I think it's essential if we're gonna resolve some of these issues that we develop that uh, ability to do so. Uh, the last point I would comment on some is the need for incentives. And we talk a lot about that, not only to incentivize landowners, certainly, uh, but to incentivize any, any array of interest out there, whether it's landowners, the energy industry, the conservation community. And that immediately leads to discussions of dollars and cents. And I think that's important. We shouldn't neglect it. But sometimes I believe we overdo that. Uh, there are many ways to incentivize various interests to do various things. And in the case of the, of the ranching landowner community, certainly dollars are helpful. Uh, a lot of people are able to do some things. They need those dollars because they're not in a lucrative occupation. They're not wealthy. But uh, they can equally be motivated by a chance to enhance the resource when they see that there's some benefit to their operation from that enhancement. If I can enter into a conservation effort to improve a landscape, and I know that if we're successful, that I'm gonna be able to run 50 more cows out there on that landscape, that's an incentive that shouldn't be overlooked. 
And finally, the third area of incentive that I, is a little harder to define, I believe, but that is just operational incentives, efficiency incentives. Uh, you know, the, the struggle that I may go through because I have to turn my livestock out not before the 1st of June and not later than the 10th of June. Uh, but if I can make my operation more efficient by being told that uh, I have some flexibility to do that between the 15th of May and the 1st of July, depending on when it fits my operation based on climatic conditions, based on forage production that particular year, that alone can be an incentive that moves me to want to be engaged in a conservation program. So I think it's really important that we keep that whole uh, range of incentives on the table as, as we go forward with this. Um, with that, I think that kind of lays out from what I see from a landowner perspective as both the opportunities and the challenges. I would say in closing that uh, the opportunities are limitless and I don't think any of the challenges are insurmountable if we pull together and, and engage in addressing them. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be here with the Western Governors Association, all of these familiar faces. Um, you know, what Jim Ogsbury said in the beginning really resonates with me about what um, a productive and unique institution this is, and all of you who are involved with it in really focusing on tackling challenges and finding solutions. So it's um, a great privilege to be here again working with you today. Um, I am, again, like Noreen and, and many of the others here, going to reflect on, on my experience with the sage-grouse um, conservation effort as a, a frame of reference to really think about um, how can we succeed at, at landscape scale conservation in a way um, that moves us forward and achieves the goals that we've set out for ourselves to deconflict, right? to achieve um, wildlife conservation and, and also the economic activity that that wildlife brings to the West, but also all of the other uses um, so that we don't have to knock them out um, to, 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 to maintain our own um, preferred use. And, you know, when I think about what allowed us, you know, not to create the perfect plan, because I know there are challenges and, and different points of view. On, on where we landed and, and whether that was the end or, or the beginning. But I think um, most of us believe that it was an critically important stepping stone and it achieved the goal that we all collectively across that enormous landscape that Noreen articulated set out to achieve, right, that we wanted to conserve the sage grouse and its ecosystem so that a ESA listing was not necessary. And having that common purpose and agreeing uniformly that that's what we were there to do, I think was incredibly important. Um, and there was a real motivation to achieve it for everyone who was there, um, most of people around that table. Um, and, and Noreen and others have talked about that. It was, you know, to a large degree, the ESA. But again, I think to Jim's point, what else made this successful? It wasn't just that there was this threat, that there was this goal, but there was really extraordinary leadership from governors, from ran private landowners, from industry, from county commissioners, from the agencies that, the way we were gonna address it was to come together to talk through the issues and to find a solution. When we, there was the announcement in September 2015 that a listing wasn't warranted, I'll rem always remember Governor Sandoval said too often, you know, it's easier to fight than to work together. And we know that that's true, especially where I come from, um, to you today from Washington, D.C. But the fact that the leaders of the states, of the agencies, of the industries, and the land said the way that we're gonna solve this problem is to work together was critical. 
those tables, right, that, that the, the people who've come before me, Jim and Noreen, mentioned. The local level, at the state level, at the national level, there was a lot of effort and thought put into creating those tables where people would come together to try to craft solutions. And having those forums, having that infrastructure, having those opportunities and to talk to each other was r critical to coming to that, that center of gravity um, with the, that the agreement in 2015 provided. And together, I think all of that, all, all of the table, um, the leadership, the motivation, uh, it really led to those relationships that we all know are really important if we're gonna work together uh, and agree and compromise. The relationships to really know um, the people that you're working with, what do they need, what are their constraints. They need to make a living, they have a legal obligation, there are politics, right, that it, everyone has to deal with. And if you understand what the people around you need and what their constraints are, it really helps you to build that trust, think creatively, and work together toward a solution. And I think, you know, those pieces are what, you know, give me the hope that we're gonna move forward and really come to a place where we can do this in a more systematic way. Because through efforts like Sage Grouse and so many others that many of you are a part of, right, we're, we have those relationships, they're there. And, and we can work together to tackle new problems. We don't have to start from the beginning. Those tables, those forums, whether it's the Sage Grouse Implementation Team or the Sagebrush Ecosystem Task Force in Nevada or others around the country at the local level, the Sage Grouse Task Force, WGA, WAFLA, those tables are still there to tackle these kinds of issues in this kind of way that we're doing today. And we have models of success that I think are their own motivation, right? We're talking about how do we move back this timeline from a species has been listed or it's found, been found warranted to be listed or it's a, been petitioned to be listed. How do we move back from that timeline where we're not so pressured and I think the models of success, the history of success that we've been building through sage grouse, Arctic grayling, New England cottontail, right? All, all of these species, I think, build that sense of hope that using these relationships that we have, these forums, you know, we, we know how to tackle these problems and we don't have to wait. And I think we're starting to see that, right? There was the PICOS initiative that this group did a, a webinar on, right, WGA earlier this year. And I think those tables, right, those forums can start to do that, right, the states, the counties, local, you know, what are the economic needs that you're facing? What are the trajectory? What is the economic needs of the future? You understand the wildlife and where are the conflicts gonna be? And can start to really think about what's next. And so much, I think, of, of the tension often in the land management planning, especially, but also in ESA and, and so many of these other regulatory tools is the certainty that's required once you're in an ESA situation, right? Requires these hard rules and people want flexibility and that's understandable. But when we're sitting down and there isn't a model of a mitigation system that's been built, or there isn't a track record on a voluntary system that's been proven with data over time. You're left to rely on regulatory approaches. But again, we're starting to build these systems. We're starting to build this record that we can rely more heavily on these tools in the future. And I think that will just continue to make this collaborative con conservation easier, not easy, but easier. I, the one other thing I would, I would mention is, you know, we talk a lot about collaborative conservation and often it, I think it's in the context of planning. 
and I think we all know this, right? If you go through a strategic plan um, or a land management plan and it's so hard and you think it's done only to realize implementation is actually much harder than the planning. And I think with you know, my ex experience uh, short at the agencies be before you know, at the beginning of the implementation stage is that the structure for implementing at that scale, the training to implement at that scale, the incentive to continue and the practice and the training to continue, that kind of collaboration that happens in planning into the decision making that happens in implementation isn't built. And I think that's another huge part of where we can go next, right, is to create those incentives, carry on those tables, continue that collaboration into, into implementation. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So uh, I'm not used to standing in front of a uh, non-mobile microphone, so I'll do the best I can. So I, I just want to thank WGA for uh, a three and a half year journey of collegiate collaboration on not just ESA, but funding, which is important to what, what I do, uh, and how we do the private-federal partnership. So it's been great, Zach. Thanks for putting everything together. Uh, one of the things Zach asked me to do is a little bit different, is to give you the journey of cross-boundary that I've seen in my career. Um, uh, by degree, wildlife ecologist. Uh, started my journey in consulting, but most of my career is in oil and gas and worked for three different oil companies, uh, working on uh, planning, permitting, and uh, avoidance minimization and compensatory mitigation uh, from the forests of East Texas all the way to the Great Basin. And that was some of my job, but I was really privileged to work on corporate social responsibility projects where there were non-regulatory related projects that we were doing in the community or the habitat that allowed me to really start working with the folks in this room uh, whether it's uh, the pilot uh, sage grouse uh, uh, credit program in, in Nevada or doing uh, tread lightly projects with, with Bob here in, in Colorado. I learned a lot and I really wanted to take that next step. Even though I still do consulting for oil and gas, my passion was really uh, for the Western heritage and the Western culture. And that was with landowners with land that they wanted to pass on the next generations but struggling to do that. And so I transitioned my career to, to work with uh, Kenny and Co. or Case, Keiko Isom. The reason why is they, they have, um, even though I still consult independently, they, they have, um, they're, they're a consulting firm on tax, tax, taxes for agriculture. And they really reach a lot of landowners that are trying to figure out how do we diversify. Diversify on how we manage lands, but also how do we diversify economically. And I found out that their economic drivers were to keep the lands in the generations so that they can do proper management of lands and conservation. So it kind of led me on this journey where I started looking at what are the four reasons why they wanted to diversify. And a lot of it was they wanted to expand operations, liquidate debt, they wanted to buy out a landowner, a succession, or they simply wanted to preserve their family heritage. So I started working on all the different mechanisms that we can fund those type of operations. And I quickly learned that we have to do also these type of uh, initiatives with our federal land partners because a lot of these landowners have private land that is, that is being, frankly, asked a lot of. And without the federal allotment or the federal lands for flexibility of the operations, we just didn't have the running room to be able to do some of the things we wanted to do on private lands. So right now I work uh, with landowners to generate this revenue for conservation purposes, whether it's generating revenue for habitat and wetlands, or it's uh, conservation easements, or compensatory mitigation, or hunting operations. All these allow them to stay on the land. And to, to take a, a quote from uh, my friends at Western Landowner uh, Alliance is, you know, 
50% of the wetlands and 50% of the endangered species are on private lands. And so what I want to do is be able to keep those generations on those lands so they're not chopped up. And we can continue to protect that 50%, but also work on those federal lands so those uh, private landowners have the flexibility they need on the, on the federal lands as well. So I found it very interesting that a couple things started happening. I had landowners that came to me and they wanted to do certain things and I went to the state agencies and, and the uh, environmental groups and said, where does this sit on the landscape? Some of the landowners sat really, really in a target area that they really wanted things to happen and some of them didn't. But the ones that were in the landscape picture, it was amazing to me how many groups came together to help that rancher meet its goals while meeting their own conservation goals. And a lot of times the state agencies or the local conservation districts will bring an opportunity to me to look at a landowner from a, from a different aspect, from a private aspect, to get them involved in a landscape scale project. And so when that happens, I, I go in from a different perspective and show them that there's really value to changing the management on the lands to increase not just the monetary, but as we talked about uh, this morning, the, if you can fit, graze a cow on 40 acres instead of 80 because you have better water tables, better ecological site descriptions that are meeting 100% threshold, that's a value to them as well. So we started looking at, at all those type of operations and we started really getting funding to pour into these private landowners and getting federal partners to start looking at flexibility on federal lands. And this is starting to happen uh, either through grants, through state uh, agency uh, uh, revenue, uh, or we, we get uh, environmental groups and even industry participating in funding some of these to, to connect the dots on multiple species, not just sage grouse. Sage grouse is part of it, but also migratory co corridors, water quality, uh, and we get a lot more funding to, to reach the uh, threshold the landowner is looking for to, to, to make the revenue worth the incentive uh, than just commodity prices. So a lot of this is uh, happening. I, my focus is in Nevada and the Great Basin. Uh, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, <coughs> Wyoming and, and Oregon, where we're looking at a pilot uh, there with the uh, state of Oregon and their, their tools on conservation, quantification, and also uh, wrapping CCAAs into compensatory mitigation. So I wanted to give you that context that cross-boundary has been successful most of my career. That's why I'm here to further, further it and to tackle this, uh, this journey with Western Governors Association and, and with you. Hopefully we get some good questions on, on this context and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Bob. John's really going to freak out here. I've got a 35-slide PowerPoint presentation. Of, I'll be getting one of those Sarah notes, won't I? Um, good afternoon. Uh, again, it's good to be back with uh, WGA uh, and continuing to talk about um, landscape scale conservation and the Endangered Species Act. And um, I want to kind of start a little story. It doesn't have anything to do with the Endangered Species Act or landscape scale or cross-boundary, but I think it'll be pertinent when, when we start talking about scale, authority, responsibility, all those things you, you, you sit around for days and meetings and meetings talking about who's going to run this and who's going to say. My, uh, I've been in Colorado just over about four and a half years now, and um, it, many of you don't know this state. This state's pretty much split in, um, split in half. You get the mountains to the west and the plains to the east. And the plains, of course, is very he heavy agriculture, very heavy ranching. Um, it's the lifeblood of this state and this country is how much agricultural production comes out of this state um, it, to the rest of the country and, and other countries. And my folks came to me and started talking about um, short grass prairies, passerine birds, um, uh, greater prairie chicken, um, this is the bigger, fatter cousin of the lesser prairie chicken um, that's listed now, or was listed now, and we have another effort going on there, but uh, pheasants, hunting opportunity, all of these types of things, and, and as an agency, as a state agency, we sit and we talk about everything these folks have mentioned. Well, what can we do? Well, you know, agriculture's out there. Um, 
it's, it's going to be tough. We're going to have to convert those lands. We're going to put easements down on the land, and we're going to convert them from high production agriculture to short grass prairie for a bunch of little birds. And, and you can, for those of you who know me, you can imagine the look on my face when they said that. Uh, and they're really passionate biologists, okay? And I said, how's our relationship out there? I don't know, not that good. Um, we run into issues here, there, everywhere. Um, we've got deer coming out and, and they're yelling at us for that and on and on and on. Um, it's not good, it's getting better. And for those of you who know who ag ir uh, irrigated agriculture, you have center pivots. And within those, they don't, they don't irrigate every square inch of that square mile, let's say. There are corners that are untouched. They don't farm them, um, and frankly, they're a pain in the butt for, for a lot of the farmers because of their weeds and those other things. And they said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we start with talking to them about would they be willing, if we paid them, would they be willing to leave those corners in conservation? Hence the name of this program, Corners in Conservation. It's about six and a half so acres each corner. And what if we were allowed to go in there, uh, reseed those things, see what happens with the birds, and on and on and on. And, and now, could you imagine the look on that private landowner's face? You want to pay me n to do nothing other than just leave it alone and let you guys do what you want. We said, yeah. Um, it was probably the look I gave my staff when they came to me. We enrolled uh, uh, $500,000 in less than four days. And my point on this is uh, that everybody else has made here is sometimes we think too big. We, we, we think such large landscape, we think the federal government is the one who needs to be running the show because they have authority. They have the responsibility under the Endangered Species Act. I think the sage grouse example that all of the panelists have mentioned will talk to you about it was locals with states through the Western governors and, and the Western Association with the federal agencies. There really wasn't anybody really saying thou shalt. And that's one of the, the biggest uh, mistakes we make is we, we want to rush in and say, and I will be the first one to tell you that, that we are probably not the agency that is in best position to manage a lot of these species. We need to be able to step back and, and determine a proper level and scale and size and authority for conservation on the ground. Um, there's a lot of things we do have. My authority runs east, west, north, and south does not include tribal lands, does not include most of the private lands as well. It's gonna be really hard to, go walk, to be able to walk in and dictate. But I think what Noreen mentioned is absolutely right on. There is leadership. And that leadership sometimes can be at the smallest scale. Think small first, then go big. The other is, is that we've got to sustain these programs over time. What? Many of you are, that are very close to the sage grouse, what happened when the service made the decision to not list? Let's go to the next one. What's the next one? Um, for those of you that are hanging in, that's my fear. How do, how do you create a program that isn't just chasing a non-listing? Are we chasing conservation? And those can be very, very different. Um, we could chase a non-listed sage grouse decision. But what about the pygmy rabbit? What about sage, sagebrush sparrow? What about all of those other things? That's, that is another factor that we need to weigh when you start talking about what is the goal here? How do you sustain that goal over time? What are those trade-offs that Jim mentioned? You go talk to a landowner, they're gonna wanna know what are you gonna take from me? Um, and we have those that will come to these tables that are, have outcome, outcomes already in their head uh, and they will negotiate that way. Um, if, if that is conservation, I think Sarah hit it on the head as well, is, is we gotta start with the local, we gotta hear every idea. Every state is different, every sage, state sage grouse plan is different. We gotta have that ability to be different, yet we're all achieving one uh, major goal and design our old plan at a local level all the way up. And then I'll leave my final comment is that 
there are entities, we, I was talking earlier that we, you have entities like the Western Governors Association and the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I don't think we would have accomplished what we did without them. They play a critical role in this um, for the leadership reasons, for the funding reasons, for all of the political reasons that are out there. Um, I think we should be looking at some of those so sort of organizations um, much more um, and Jim's probably going to kill me, uh, but I, I think I think we're WGA and WAFA how they work together on these issues. I think I think we got the result that we needed, but it's also going to help us sustain that conservation over the long term. So thank you guys very much, and I look forward to your questions. We've got about 15 minutes to see what we can get to here. So. The first question, I'll kind of combine them, and, and we've got shared mics, so just um, take your turn when I get to you or not. Just go ahead and grab the mic. Um, so we want to ask what other examples exist for cross-boundary conservation successes, and what can we learn from them? And let me add to it, is it going to take, as Bob just suggested, Often we do this because there's a pending worry about a listing, or are there others out there where we can get ahead of the regulatory curve where we're not necessarily worried about an ESA problem? What's next? What are some, what are some potential uh, um, examples or successes that we might be, start, we might be talking about next? Um, whether they be small, like Bob said, in the corners, or bigger ones. So anybody that wants to take a stab at that one. Go ahead. <laughs> I would mention one that I brought up earlier this morning. It has nothing to do with ESA, but uh, I think it's an example of cross-boundary uh, collaboration, and in Wyoming at least, what we've been able to do on migration corridors for wildlife deer and elk and an or deer and antelope primarily, where they cross th these large 120, 150 mile migrations, federal lands, state lands, wide variety of private lands, and we've been able to come together and develop some approaches there that I think have been very successful. Anybody else? I mean, aren't we all worried about what's coming next? <laughs> I, I guess I'll, I'll add, uh, and it, obviously it's a topic in one of the, the, the panels uh, coming up, and it's also an initiative, is my biggest concern as parallel is invasive species. Uh, it's a huge issue. You cannot address ESA or special status species or uh, big game without the issue of, of invasives, and particularly Medusa head and cheatgrass. It's a huge issue. And, uh, you know, as a panel, I don't think we're going to dive into it here because there's other, another panel that's going to handle that, and there's also an initiative. But for me, not just that, it, it is going on. Uh, it, it's over the last two years I've seen where you have a migratory corridor, you have sage grouse, you have a listed trout species, and multiple organizations are coming up saying, help us show the, the, the landowner the value of some of these programs. And it's starting to piece together. Um, because of compensatory mitigation got a lot of landowners' attention. It's, it's now a kind of a gray area, but it's got them thinking about there is ecological services on their lands that are valuable instead of just the commodities. And it's brought a lot of uh, discussions with state and federal agencies that didn't happen before. So that, that's one of the ways I think is, is happening without a driver of ESA is a, a lot of these, it's hard to fund conservation with one entity. So what we're doing is bringing multiple entities whether it's the environmental community and hook and bullet and state agencies and the NRCS all together to make the funding incentives for landowners to look at what they're doing and how they can preserve it without losing it to the next generation. So, Ryan, go ahead. I'll just mention one that I see that's um, quickly coming closer on the horizon that I think we could be paying attention to before it's at a crisis stage, and that is across the Great Plains of the United States where we have um, declining, a group, the fastest declining group of birds is grassland birds, probably some of the same species that Bob mentioned. We still have an opportunity to get ahead of that, I think. Not that we haven't had some ESA petitions, but we're not at a crisis stage. 
also have some concerns about pollinators, monarch butterflies, and bees, but we have large intact remaining blocks of grassland. And we have, I think, a natural partnership with the producer community, with ranchers in the Great Plains who also need grass, who also need grass. So there's an opportunity there, I think, for us to think ahead before we get to a crisis stage on a really collaborative cross-boundary approach. Grab the mic. Perfect. That connects to what what Noreen said. You know, when I look at the um, landscape scale projects that happened at Interior, you know, some were like sage grouse were driven by the the species. Some were driven by you know the economic um, by economic drivers, and and states and or the country looking for certainty um, to be able able to move an industry forward renewable and solar energy in the Southwest, right? The solar energy, PEIS. And so if you are looking at that grassland challenge as we know that we, ranching is a huge economic driver here, we know that we want to keep it vibrant. And so we're gonna attack it from that perspective rather than an ESA. You know, states and others, they have a lot of knowledge, they have a lot of tools. And I think we, we may, that may be able to help, again, bring it back from that brink point when you're, the driver is the ESA. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to add to anything? Yeah, John, I, I yeah. think, um, don't, not to pile on what others have said, but I think it shows the importance of having data and having information, the natural heritage programs around that, that you know that we're working with landowners to to ask those same questions. I mean, we we have state wildlife action plans. We have um, petitions that will come in, and we end up doing is reacting instead of instead of looking out and seeing where some of these areas are missing. And and I know with the data and the private land um, concerns with it, and they're real, um, but. We, we, we've got to continue to fight for, for the, the data and the science that will go into those future decisions instead of um, waiting for a call. Uh, the, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service gets a petition and the, the service will say, send us you know, what you have. I mean, what a dark day that will be when we don't have anything to send back. That's, that's our concern here in Colorado is to continue to collect, be able to collect that data and information for those. Um, Robert, I know that when on the conference call we talked about this and we wanted to make sure we worked this question in because you think about it a lot and that's, if I fra get, get, phrase it right, sort of the growing uncertainty around being able to use some of these mitigation measures because of, of regulatory, I guess, questioning and uncertainty how the future is going to be and so the, the, your mitigation stuff's there but as you call it now, it's a bit of a gray area. You want to elaborate on that a little bit more for the folks who are interested in that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I guess uh, w one of the issues is, uh, you know, we're going through another change with, with the sage grouse and, and uh, amending those, uh, those plans. And we're trying really hard, um, I'm going to put my plug to the states, we're really trying for the um, Department of Interior to recognize the state's plans and the, the state process, especially in Wyoming, uh, where I've been heavily a part of that, where, where the governor was, was, was very adamant about putting an executive order together, a core policy, and, and a compensatory mitigation framework. Uh, and it's similar in, in Nevada, but, but a little bit different. And we're trying to make sure the states maintain management of that bird, but also m the mitigation structure that they have put together, similar in, in Colorado, they've been working on for, for years, and, and, and we just don't know. Uh, from a landowner standpoint, we just don't know. We had momentum, and we just don't know where it's going. So I'll be honest with you, in 25 years, a lot of landowners didn't want to talk to me about conservation easements, but in the last three years, I've had more people talk to me about conservation easements than I have ever imagined, and these are staunch anti-conservation easement folks, simply because they need a mechanism to diversify. Um, and this is outside of Colorado because Colorado has such a robust uh, GOCO funding. The other thing I wanted to, to mention, and I know Zach wanted to weave this in, is, is the, the NEPA issue of doing conservation on federal lands. Uh, a lot of times, whether it was in industry or ag, 
We wanted to do something uh, on federal lands, but the motivation wasn't there because we had to do NEPA on something that's proactive and positive without a uh, categorical exclusion. And a lot of times we had to go look for private landowners to do mitigation because we couldn't do it on federal lands, even though that's really where the target was. That's where the invasive was. That's where the fire regime was. But no one wanted to have go through the funding or the timelines of NEPA just to do proper fire control as a mitigation process. Uh, you know, landowners' incentives, uh, again, doing something on their federal allotment that is healthy for the range and for, for their operation, again, has to go through the NEPA process or they risk going through their permit, again, for the allotment. So we spent a lot of time in one of the sessions in Western Governor Association trying to re revamp the, the legal protection of categorical exclusions when we're trying to do conservation on federal land. So. I think, let me see if we've got time for one or two quick questions. I don't want to um, neglect somebody out there who's got a burning question. Does somebody? We have a mic we can get to you. Um, and here it is. Anybody want to give something a shot? If you do, and we don't get to it, or you think of it later, remember, they'll get to a member of WGA, and then also, obviously, at the reception tonight, um, there'll be time to, to talk to somebody kind of off the record and, and do that. Um, I'm wondering if there's time. We maybe, we got a couple minutes before I switch panels, so let me ask one more to anybody, and it's quick. We're, we were looking for drivers of, uh, that exist for conservation of large landscapes uh, short of impending regulatory action. We've kind of talked about it, but it's something that, that I see is so important in this, and yet it seems to be a hit and miss in its relationships. And I'm more about how do we deal with when you've got good relationships and for whatever reason a key person leaves gets, for example, transferred or moves on to another job, and now you've got to restart to some extent the conversations. Um, or even more fundamentally, teaching somebody new the importance of, of relationships and everything, not just knowledge. Anybody want to take a quick stab at that? I realize I hit you at the last minute with that one. I may in this way that I think you've actually raised uh, a critical issue out there, and that is we're trying to build a partnership, and as an example, you've got a landowner who's the fifth generation on a piece of land uh, dealing with an agency official uh, who's very knowledgeable from an academic perspective, but maybe uh, have arrived in the last three months to that area. So not only is their knowledge of the resource very different, but their communication isn't there in place. And I constantly emphasize to my rancher members, if you get a new BLM range con or someone like that, don't wait till you have an issue that you need to go sit down with them in their office. Call them up and ask them to meet you for a cup of coffee. And I would give that same advice to agency personnel that the minute you're somewhere new and because of the system, that happens very frequently, uh, begin to build personal relationships prior to getting into dealing with the, the substantive issues. Jim, that's great, uh, and I think, and I'll close the panel with this, maybe that's something a lot of us in the various universities that, that train these people, and BSU is not a land grant, so we don't, we're a little different. Um, we're not Wyoming, we're not Utah State, we're not Colorado State, and so forth, but, but teaching students that it's important to go learn how to have a cup of coffee with someone as it is to get an A on a test in terms of knowledge. So let's pause here.